right, continuing with the prologue, we're on line 165. A monk there was, one made for mastery, an outrider who loved his venery, a manly man to be an abbot able. Full many a blooded horse had he in stable, and when he rode men might his bridle hear a jingling, and the whistling wind is clear, ay, and as loud as does the chapel bell, where this brave monk was of the cell. The rule of Morris or St. Benedict, by reason it was old and somewhat strict. This said, Monk, let much old things slowly pace, and followed new world manners in their place. He cared not for that text, a clean plucked hen, which holds that hunters are not holy men, nor that a monk, when he is cloisterless, is like unto a fish that is waterless. What is to say, a monk out of his cloister? But this same text he held not worth an oyster. And I said his opinion was right good. What? Should he study as a madman would upon a book in cloister cell, or yet go labor with his hands and swink and sweat, as Austin bids? How shall the world be served? Let Austin have his toil to him reserved? Therefore he was a rider day and night. Greyhounds he had, as swift as bird in flight since riding and the hunting of the hare were all his love, for no cost would he spare. I saw his sleeves were per purfled at the hand with gray, with fur of gray, the finest in the land. Also to fasten hood beneath his chin, he had of good wrought gold a curious pin, a love knot in the larger end there was, his head was bald and shone like any glass, and smooth as one anointed was his face. That was this lord, he stood in goodly case, his bulging eyes he rolled about, and hot they gleamed in red, like fire beneath a pot. His boots were soft, his horse of great estate, now certainly he was a fine prelate. He was not pale as some poor wasted ghost, a fat swan loved the best of any roast, his palfrey was as brown as is a berry. Okay, so the monk... Like, when you hear the word monk, you probably think a guy with a bad haircut and a brown robe who prays all the time and copies the Bible by hand. But this monk is quite different. He wears jewelry and fur, and he has a stable full of horses, and he likes to go hunting. And he doesn't honor the vows that uh, most monks take about poverty or silence, or things of that nature. Uh, so, he's a monk only by name. Okay, so we have a monk who likes to hunt, and apparently has pretty good money, because he has horses and hunting hounds, a fur coat, and jewelry. Um, that's two members of the clergy. Neither one looks too religious. See if that trend continues. Now we're to the friar. A friar is similar to a monk, but I think they... What is the difference between a monk and a friar? I think the friar works more with the community than a monk does. A friar there was, a wanton and a merry, a limiter, a very festive man. In all the orders for is none that can equal his gossip and his fair language. He had arranged full many a marriage of young of women young, and this at his own cost. Unto his order he was of a noble post, well liked by all, and intimate was he with Franklins everywhere in his country, and with the worthy women of the town, for at confessing he'd more power in gown, as he himself said, than in good curate, for of his order he was licentiate. He heard confession gently, it was said, gently absolved too, leaving naught of dread. He was an easy man to give penance, when knowing he should gain a good pittance. For to a begging friar money given is sign that any man has well been well shriven. For if one gave he dared to boast of this, he took the man's repentance not amiss. For many a man there is so hard of heart he cannot weep, however pains may smart. 
Therefore, instead of weeping and of prayer, men should give silver to poor friars all bare. His tippet was stuck, always full of knives and pens to give to young and pleasing wives, and certainly he kept a merry note. Well could he sing and play upon the rote. At balladry he bore the prize away, his throat was white as lily of the may. Yet together he was a as ever champion. In towns he knew the taverns, every one. And every good host, and each barmaid too, better than begging lepers, these he knew. For unto no such solid man as he accorded it as far as he could see. To have sick lepers for acquaintances, there is no honest advantageousness in dealing with such poverty-stricken curs. It's with the rich and with big victuallers. And so, wherever profit might arise, courteous he was and humble in men's eyes. There was no other man so virtuous. He was the finest beggar of his house. A certain district being farmed to him, none of his brethren dared approach its rim. For though a widow had no shoes to show, so pleasant was his in principio, uh, he always got a farthing ere he went. He lived by pickings, it is evident, and he could romp as well as any whelp. On love days could he be of mickle help. For there he was not like a cloisterer with th threadbare cope as is the poor scholar, but he was like a lord or like a pope. Of double worsted was his semi-cope that rounded like a bell, as you may guess, he lisped a little out of wantonness to make his English upon soft upon his tongue and in his harping after he had sung. His two eyes twinkled in his head as bright as do the stars within the frosty night. This worthy limiter was named Hubert. Okay, lot to unpack here. The friar is actually a despicable person because um, he poses as a holy man and he's supposed to go out and help his community, but he doesn't do it. Um, he hangs out at taverns and he hangs out with women, married or not. And um, he doesn't wear threadbare clothes, but has really nice clothes. Like you, you might even mistake him for the Pope. He dresses so well. And he doesn't spend time with the sick or the needy. Um, he says he can hear confessions, but really uh, that power is dictated to other members of the church. But he does it so that he can take bribes. Like, oh, you've sinned? Well, give me some money and I'll pray for God and he'll forgive you. And so he can, he'll even take money from a poor, poor woman it says he'll get a farthing from her just the same. All right. And uh, yeah, he's a good singer because he spends all his time at bars singing a lot and drinking and having a good time. And that is the friar. Okay, what do we say about the friar? He's very much not religious. Um, he, let me see, he begs and takes money for confessions. He hangs out at bars. And avoids the sick and needy. The name is Hubert. It might come up. Okay, moving on. Okay, not all of the descriptions are super long. Like, a lot of them are much shorter. Like the merchant. There was a merchant with forked beard and girt and motley gown, and high on horse he sat, upon his head a Flemish beaver hat. His boots were fastened rather elegantly. He sp his spoke his notions outright pompously, stressing the times when he had won, not lost. He would the sea were held at any cost, Across from Middleburg to Orwell Town, at money changing he could make a crown. This worthy man kept all his wits well set. There was no one could say he was in debt. So well he governed all his trade affairs, with bargains and with borrowings and with shares. 
Indeed, he was a worthy man withal, but sooth to say, his name I can't recall. Okay, this merchant deals with like beaver hides and stuff like that, and he he dresses well and shows off wealth, but um, he has a hidden secret. Like, um, one of the things you may have noticed already about Chaucer is he doesn't speak poorly of anybody. Like the friar is a terrible person, um, but Chaucer is very kind with his words. And you just kind of like figure out, you know, okay, a, what's a friar doing in a tavern? And why doesn't he like helping lepers? So you, you know, it sounds like he's a nice guy, but he's actually, you know, very devious. This merchant is not all that he presents himself to be. Like one of the reasons why he thinks that there should be uh, more police at the sea between Middleburg and Orwell Town is probably because a pirate attacked one of his investments and left him penniless. So he's not as rich as he is appearing to be um, because he's had some bad investments. All right, the next, oh, let's type him. Okay, the merchant goes in the middle class section. He dresses fine. And once better police presence in the waterways. Probably because one of his ships got robbed. Okay, moving on. Next is the clerk, a clerk from Oxford, sometimes also called the Oxford cleric, was with us also who turned to getting knowledge long ago, as meager was his horse as is a rake. So he's got a skinny horse. Nor he himself too fat, I'll undertake, but he looked hollow and went soberly. Right threadbare was his overcoat, for he had got him yet no churchly benefice, nor was so worldly as to gain office. For he would rather have at his bed's head some twenty books all bound in black and red of Aristotle and his philosophy than rich robes, fiddle, or gay psaltery. Yet, and for all he was philosopher, he had but little gold within his coffer. But all that he might borrow from a friend on books and learning he would swiftly spend. And then he'd pray right busily for their souls of those who gave him wherewithal for schools. Pardon the interruption, everyone. All right, where were we? Um, of study, look, he utmost care and heed. Not one word spoke he more than was his need. And that was said in fullest reverence and short and quick and full of high good sense, pregnant of moral virtue was his speech, and gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Okay, the Oxford cleric is poor. He looks poor. He's got a skinny horse, and he himself is skinny. His clothes are worn out and ugly. Um, he spends all his time studying. Like, um, when he borrows money from people, he spends the money on more, more schooling. He's constantly reading and... Uh, he's just like one of those college kids who just never gets out of college, never graduates. They keep taking classes and taking classes and taking classes. Uh, but he's a nice guy. I mean, he doesn't talk a lot. Um, he's very modest. Uh, just studies too much. Where does the cleric go? I'm going to put him with the clergy, I guess. Because... Like most of his philosophy and stuff is going to be about, you know, religious practices. And, you know, people who went to school back in those days usually were uh, studying for the clergy. That's the clerk. 